Hey guys, this is Mr. V and this is Apes Review Video, topic 6.3, fuel types and uses. So in this video, we're going to talk about the different uh, fuel types and those vary, right? So you can have, uh, and again, these are the, some of them are renewable, some are non, but you can have some uh, common fuel types like wood, peat, coal, natural gas, and crude oil. And we're going to talk about how those can become energy. So the first is wood fuel, right? So if you're thinking about wood fuel, now the way the, this might be framed on an AP exam would be that they'd be talking about um, what we'd call developing countries and how um, these developing countries may use this as firewood or charcoal and use that for primarily heating purposes, right? So, uh, and that makes them, the thing that they would use them for is for heating and that's because they're really accessible. They can get uh, be gotten to pretty quickly and um, they can then be used as an energy source for uh, a home to heat it during winter months um, or to cook and things like that. Now um, as you go from here you start to go from wood to eventually peat. Now peat is organic material that's partially decomposed and typically you see this stuff in what are called bogs and uh, swamps, right? Um, and they uh, they take thousands of years to form, so it's not as long as a fossil fuel. They're considered a fossil fuel technically, but they um, can be unearthed pretty easily, and they're a little bit more efficient um, than using a wood fuel. So that's something to think about uh, when it comes to these. And then, of course, you get to the true fossil fuels that we're used to um, for heating and for energy production, and that's coal. Okay, so coal is going to be um, this material, this plant material that has been uh, heated and pressurized and pushed down into the ground um, through millions of years of time, and you end up with variations of it. It's important to know the variations because on an AP question, either multiple choice or even free response, they might ask you about the energy efficiency of these and whether or not they'd be useful um, in certain situations, right? So there's three main types. You get the lignite coal, right? And this tends to be pretty brown. Um, it's low carbon amounts and it's low grade. So, you know, think of it in terms of like, you know, wood, peat, and then you get lignite, right? So um, that tends to be the next step. And then after that, you get to the bituminous coal, right? Subbituminous and bituminous. Those are going to be the kind that give you high heat energy. And that typically is measured in BTU or British Thermal Units. Um, and it's common actually in the United States. So we have a lot of bituminous coal. And the best is going to be anthracite. Okay, anthracite is the highest uh, grade coal. It's very hard, it's kind of brittle. Okay, it breaks pretty easily. It's got a ton of carbon and it's got low variation, meaning it doesn't have any uh, many impurities in there. So that's coal's kind of um, you know claim to in fame, not really fame, is that coal tends to have a lot of uh, uh, impurities. But when you get to anthracite coal, that tends to be the most pure form, um, and that's a good thing because then you can get a lot of heat energy out of that. And then of course we talk about natural gas. This one is uh, typically it's going to be things like methane, um, and what's nice about it is it has much less impurities than coal, and um, it reduces our CO2 amounts by 50 to 60 percent uh, if you're talking if you're comparing it to coal or oil even, um, and that's a good thing. So it's technically considered to be the cleanest form of fossil fuel. So you know one thing I do want to make sure that you that we're clear about is when you hear the term clean. Uh, fossil fuel, that doesn't really mean a lot. That just means that it's not going to release secondary um, pollutants in there, right? Um, and it's not going to have um, any, um, as much uh, carbon dioxide. So, you know, natural gas is a great improvement, but it is still a fossil fuel. You're still adding CO2. And, you know, you're going to see there's many types. There's ethane, uh, propane, butane, um, the condensates, and then these can be liquefied to make liquefied natural gas and used as a fuel in vehicles. So, um, you know, this can be used as a form of energy for a power grid or in vehicles as well. And then of course you have crude oil, which has to be drilled mainly on either land or in the ocean. Now, um, a lot of the times the, uh, since we've been so far into the industrial revolution and we've taken so much coal uh, and so much crude oil, uh, we're now moving out into the ocean or we're getting forms that are very um, impure. So um, in Canada, there tends to be a lot of uh, tar sands. And that's where you're going to get clay and sand and water and some bitumen in there, as well as some crude oil. Um, and so that's going to be a form that's great. But the problem is, 
is that you have to separate a lot of that and you have to take a lot of land still. So while we, you know, the typical oil is now taken from uh, the oceans, you still can get um, some of that um, taken out uh, in these tar sands. So here's how that tar sand extraction works. Um, you have to do a bunch of mining, right, uh, in the reserves. And so the on-site processing can work on there. That's something called the in situ, right? And so that ends up getting 20% of those. And so here's how it works. You basically inject some steam in there to break things up and loosen it up. And you can extract the oil that you want and the bitumen as well. And you have to separate all these. So you end up having to separate them with water. That's going to be a big problem with tar sands is you have to obviously mine the land. So you're destroying habitat there. And you're going to have to use water to separate this. So you're uh, going to have to uh, use another resource. And then the other downside too is that this tends to be in a location where there's not a lot of easy travel ways to get to the rest of the world. So this tends to be in uh, Canada. And so um, there's pipelines that have been proposed um, to get this all the way from Canada down to uh, Galveston, Texas, and then uh, ship that to around the world. Or now, since pipelines in the United States uh, currently are not um, uh, approved as much, there's going to be a lot of movement of either by rail or by car out to there. So you end up having to use other resources as well. So um, that's going to be one of the downsides, uh, many one of the many downsides of using tar sands. And so it's important to know where these fuels are going and what they're used for typically. So coal is a home electricity. It's a power grid fuel, right? You're not going to be putting coal into the engine of your car. Okay. Oil is a vehicle fuel typically. Um, and then natural gas is a home electricity fuel typically as well. But if it's liquefied, you can also make it a vehicle fuel as well. So there are some comparisons to think about there and to keep in mind. And of course, one of the things that we've been looking into to make this more efficient is uh, cogeneration, right? So we burn fuel to provide electricity, but you end up with huge losses of heat. That's the second law of thermodynamics is that once you convert heat into something else, um, or once you convert uh, an energy source, heat is lost. And you know, that's because of entropy, right? So what we do with cogeneration is the idea is, well, let's capture that heat and use it so that we can increase our efficiency of that source up to 70% more. So let's look at a couple of diagrams on that. Okay, so if you look right here, you have cogeneration um, improving efficiency. So if you look right here on the top, um, you've got 1000 BTUs of natural gas being burned and 67%, two thirds are lost to heat. Okay. Um, and then of the parts that are, 7% is lost due to transmission, right? You, you have to have power lines moving all the electricity and the power lines will get hot or the towers will get hot. And then finally, you're down to about 26% uh, efficiency or about 300 BTUs in the house being used, okay? Which isn't bad, but when you put a thousand in, that's not a great, um, that's not a great output, right? So um, how does this end up being better. And so that's where cogeneration comes in. The idea is here on the bottom that you take those thousand um, uh, BTUs and you put them in to a cogeneration uh, power plant where they're gathering, they're getting the electricity, but they're also saving some of the heat and transporting the heat to buildings or homes or, you know, locations where the heat would be useful. And so what happens here is of the thousand BTUs that go in, about 45% of the thermal uh, energy is collected, about 40% of the electricity is collected. And overall, for a building or a home, you could use 700 BTUs of the thousand originally. So you see, we're using the same source, but we're wasting less of it. And that would mean that we would end up having to use less of that source. So that's the idea. Uh, Cogeneration can be, um, a positive there. Now, of course, the downside is this is expensive and you have to have the pre-planning and infrastructure to put this in. Uh, it's very difficult to take your typical already done power grid and convert it to this without spending a lot of money. And that's something that, um, you know, government organizations may not want to do or just don't want to do. Um, and then, of course, if you regulate it, then who pays for that? So um, it, it tends to be a, an issue there, but it, it's a great plan if it's planned out in advance. So that's something to think about. 
So here's a bunch of resources on the different energy sources that you can use. Um, hopefully these will be helpful and uh, hopefully this was helpful. Thank you.